And he told them a parable, saying, The land of the rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grains and goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. The things you have prepared, whose will they be? So the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Well, good morning. Congratulations, seniors. So excited for you and uh, man, excited to be with you guys today. My name is Dan uh, and I'm the lead pastor here. If you're new, uh, as Brenna and Kevin said, we're so glad that you're here uh, with us today. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better. And I'll be out in the Welcome Center uh, right after the service. We'd love to say hi personally for that. We're going to be in Luke chapter 12 today uh, in God's Word. So if you have a copy of your own, go ahead and turn that. If not, no worries. We've got it up here on the screen uh, to follow along. As you're turning there, Uh, I do have a few announcements for you. Uh, We don't typically do this in the message segment, but these are really important things in the life of our church. Uh, We have an annual meeting every year. It's a members meeting called a family meeting uh, at the end of each year where we vote on the budget and we talk about the vision for the future. Uh, And so uh, we're obviously not in 2018 anymore. Uh, We're in 2019. But at the end of 2018, uh, we had that meeting uh, together. We prayed together and we looked to the future together and we made some key decisions. And so I'm just going to give a few updates uh, for our church family today. And even if you're a guest with us, you can kind of hear a little bit about our vision of where we're going, even through the things that we're planning. Uh, and where we're kind of directing our attention and our focus uh, in the coming months. One of the things that we decided uh, at the end of 2018 is that we needed to make a step uh, from a part-time role with our preschool ministry to a full-time preschool director position. When we first started... um, when we first started as a, uh, as a ministry, we were a college ministry. We had about 40 or 50 college students, so there was no need uh, for preschool. Uh, there was no, uh, that wasn't on the radar, it wasn't on the map as we developed into a campus and then became an autonomous church. Uh, the pendulum has swung uh, to the fact that uh, our biggest demographic now are preschoolers and their parents. Actually, preschoolers have overrun this place, okay, uh, in a really good way. Uh, that hallway, we've had to go out from that hallway into other hallways. We have these portable buildings, all that kind of stuff, uh, but it's continued to grow and the influence with that. And so what we've always done uh, is we've had part-time roles. It started as a volunteer role. It's moved into a part-time role. Now it's two part-time roles, and we knew in 2019 that it would need to become uh, one full-time role. Uh, partner with that is our one of our preschool directors, Marianne Green, had informed us at the end of last year that the Lord was calling her to move out of that role, uh, back into just a service role within the church, and spend time focusing on her family, her uh, new grandchild, and her parents. Uh, and so we knew we were playing on that. Uh, one of our interns, Elizabeth Wyke, who had also been serving as one of those uh, preschool directors, uh, she said that she feels called to ministry. She's graduating. She's one of our graduates. Uh, and uh, we knew we were praying with her about what the Lord was telling her to do. Along the way with that, God continued to affirm to us and confirm through all of our prayers together, uh, the next step was to hire this full-time person. And so over the last couple months, uh, we've been going through that search process, praying through that, and then God uh, brought the whole thing together as he always does, uh, and he brought someone to us. We were looking for three qualities uh, with that. One was someone that had experience and training in early childhood education. The other one was that had a specific calling to preschoolers and preschool families and the ministry of the church. And then thirdly, someone that understood, was invested in, and believed in the calling and the vision of Journey uh, as a church as it pertains to partnering with families to fuel faith in the next generation. Uh, And so we didn't have to look very far. Uh, God uh, brought someone to us that had been with us from the very beginning uh, to fill that position and to take us into the new season. And so I want to introduce uh, her to you. But before I do, I also want to say thank you to Marian Green uh, for all of her last two years of service in that role and to Elizabeth for doing that as well. So can we thank them so much for that? 
Elizabeth is going to be staying on. Uh, she's going to be splitting time with preschool and helping in that because it is a big load. And then she's also going to be helping with our college girls ministry uh, as well. So she's going to be coming on full time. And on June 1st, our new preschool director will be joining us. And it's Crystal Polk. Uh, Crystal and her family are here. Uh, this is my, you can clap for that. That's good. That's good. Uh, this is Michael, this is Lauren, Katie, and Jack, uh, and uh, Crystal has been with us from the very beginning. She actually started serving uh, in our preschool ministry when we very first started, when we were a portable church uh, at, at, on the campus of Arkansas State University, and so we're excited about that. June 1st uh, will be her first day uh, as she does that. She's been teaching in the Brooklyn school system with preschoolers uh, there for the last several years, and so it's going to be a natural transition to come over and help lead us into this new season with our preschool uh, and family ministries. The other thing that we were looking at uh, and that we made a decision on is our primary strategy around here is uh, journey groups. So you, we don't call them classes or Sunday school. It's not because we don't like that term. Uh, we just believe that uh, for us to be uh, the church we want to be is to move out of rows and to move into circles where we're in relationship around God's word. You hear, heard Kevin and Brennan talking about just a minute ago. That is the pulse and that's the core of who we are. With that, the, we have pressing needs administratively as we expand and grow, which I'll be talking about a, a little bit today as well. Well, and, and so with that, we also slated to begin this summer uh, another pastoral position, which is our pastor of administration uh, and community. Uh, that would have oversight over our budgeting, uh, over our uh, administrative processes and our staffing and all those kind of things, as well as uh, focusing our attention on our primary discipleship strategy of groups. And so we are in the process of talking with individuals right now about that. Uh, we're in the middle of that, and hopefully we'll have some more information in the coming weeks to share with with you pretty excited about that because that will launch us again into a new level of effectiveness as we disciple uh, and raise up people for the glory of God and, and accomplish the, the vision that God's given us, which is to uh, create, continue a movement of multiplication for the glory of God. Uh, with that, we are growing, okay? And this is the last announcement, and then we're getting to God's Word. Uh, this, I'm not an announcement guy, uh, but these are really important things. The other thing that we knew going into this year is we had to make a step with our permanent facilities here. Uh, we've had portable buildings out back. Some of you are in those, and I apologize. They are, they're not great. Uh, I have an affectionate name that I'm not going to say on stage for it. It's not gross or anything. I, that sounds really bad, like I'm going to cuss or something. I promise I'm not. Uh, but we have had those. We've had those from the very beginning. They were a temporary fix. We need a permanent solution. Uh, and so what we've been working on over the last several months is our Journey Kids Expansion Wing, which will be to the west of this building. And so uh, we've got some initial drawings for that. We're going to send those out for bid uh, coming up in the next couple of months. But I want to show you all rendering real quick so you can see where we are in the process. Um, this is on the west side of the building. You can see our existing drive through right here on the far back left corner of your photo. Up there on those bigger screens, you can see it as well. Uh, it will have an additional drive through here with another entrance that's dedicated and secure for our preschool and children. It will give us all the rooms we currently need and maybe a couple more to be able to supply for the demands of the groups that we have, journey groups, even at the youngest level, uh, as well as a large group meeting space. Uh, it will give us opportunity to do so much uh, as well as a look into the future of a, of a weekday program uh, for families that would reach and bless our community as well as other opportunities uh, with that as well. Uh, core to who we are, journey groups at every level so that we are partnering with families at every level that uh, as I'm preaching here, there are groups meeting across the hall with three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds that are preaching the gospel and raising up kids so that they never have to wonder whether or not God loves them, whether Jesus died for them, and they can have a, firm, a permanent relationship with him. Uh, and so we're very excited about that. We're going to get those numbers back to you. Uh, we've uh, been working on the budget. Everything's looking good, but we're hopefully those things will come back in uh, over the course of the next month, and then we'll be able to start uh, knowing where we go from here. So that's where we are in the process. Wanted to catch everybody up. Uh, we uh, obviously have decided on those things as a church, but that's where we are uh, in the process. All really good things. All right, now God's Word. Luke chapter 12. Um, we've been in a series that we start on Easter, and what we've been talking about is, a, 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 you get it in the series title called The Heart 
of the Father. Uh, basically, what this means is that uh, we're looking at parables or stories and situations that Jesus was in where he would tell a story. Uh, and what he would do is basically define for us the true heart of the Father or in many ways redefine for us uh, what the heart of the Father really was. And the reason for that is really simple. Uh, it's not any different than it is today. People had preconceived notions about who God was and what he was about. Their understanding of that was oftentimes things that they would impress upon God. But how much uh, better is it to have God in the flesh, Jesus, come and say, hey, this is what God is really like. This is what God really cares about. This is what God really values. And this is what God thinks is really, really important. And we've looked at some really important factors of what it means to have a relationship with God with the prodigal son in that story. Last week, we learned about the Good Samaritan uh, and what it means now to be a neighbor to someone, not just ask who is our neighbor, but to actually say, who are we a neighbor to? And this week, we're going to... Our stuff, he's going to talk about our money, he's going to talk about our possessions. And the reason for that is there is a natural way that all of us looks at our stuff. Uh, we all look at the things we have, and it's natural to us. Nobody has to tell a kid uh, when, uh, when Christmas comes around to ask for things. They want things, right? Uh, when you put a, a present in front of a, a graduate, they're going to open that thing up, and they're hoping for more cash, I think, probably so, am I right? Uh, we want more cash because uh, we got all these things that we're wanting. We want these things, and there's something in, innate in us that pulls us. It's natural to want things. But what Jesus is going to reveal to us in the story today is... Though there are some natural things about all of us when it, thinks, when it pertains to our money and our possessions, that there is a new way for us to look at it. The gospel presents to us a new understanding of the way we see our finances, the way we see our stuff, the way we see our possessions. And in doing so, the story that you heard read on the screen just a minute ago is a story that gets to the heart of the Father and gets to our hearts because oftentimes, Jesus would say this, that where we find our hearts is where we find our treasure, and where we find our treasure is where we find our heart. Our possessions, our stuff, have a powerful part of our life. So much so that out of all the parables, I mean, Jesus told somewhere around 38, 40 parables, 16 of them deal with money. And there's a reason for that. It wasn't because God needs our money or the church needs our money. It's because God knew that it's close to your heart and it's important to you. And he wants to have our hearts and he wants to give us freedom in that. So like all the stories that Jesus tells, this one's no different. It doesn't come out of the air. God didn't just, you know, Jesus didn't just grab it and say, hey, let me tell you a little story. There was a situation that precipitated his telling of this parable that you just heard read. And here's the situation. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, to set the scene for just a little bit, this is a, uh, if you were to back up into Luke chapter 12, let me set the context for you. Jesus is teaching. Uh, I'm just going to say it's like a setting like this, but there were people in front of him, a crowd in front of him, and he was doing dialogue. What would typically happen was the rabbi would sit uh, and people would listen to him teach. Well, somewhere along in the process, Jesus is going to town. He's talking about really important things. He's talking about what it really means uh, to, to focus on God and to walk with God and to do so without fear that God would actually not allow anything to be concealed. And so he's in this deep, deep teaching. I mean, it's this powerful teaching. And this guy, in the middle of his speech or his sermon, if you will, he pipes up and he interrupts Jesus. And he says to Jesus, Jesus, hey, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, can you imagine in a setting like this, like, I mean, I'm up here doing my thing, and uh, somebody just raised up and said, hey, listen, hey, uh, Dan, uh, I've got a problem, and I'm not Jesus, but let's just say for the sake of the argument, hey, Dan, I've got a problem with my brother. Uh, he has taken a portion of the estate of our father, and he's not giving me my just due. He's not dividing the property with me. Now, everybody in the crowd probably would be like, man, who is this guy? Who is this character that's interrupting this? This is a personal matter. This is not a, to be talked about in a public forum. But oftentimes, this shows some things. It shows the consumption of our hearts where you can listen to all the stuff from Jesus, but what's really going on in us is what's close to you. Chances are that in a room like this, I mean, even as I'm talking, you're wrestling with personal issues. 
There's things that are really important to you. There's things that, uh, that you're, you're conflicted over. There's a relationship. There's some money problems. There's an issue. And you can't really hear anything else because the biggest issue in your life is setting right in front of you. And this is the way it often goes. We need somebody to come in and give us some direction on this issue. And I can't see any other issue except this one right in front of me. And that's exactly what happens with Jesus. With everybody, with an earshot, with every eye focus on the situation, this guy just interrupts everything. He says, hey, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, nobody in this room has ever been through a problem with his estate, I'm sure, right? I mean, sure, that's, surely that's just a first century problem. But this is the way it normally goes. Dad has passed away. The law had laid out a certain way that things would be doled out among uh, the next generation. The older brother, we talked about this with the prodigal son, he would get two-thirds of the state. The younger brother would get a third of the state. He was pretty marked out. I mean, you couldn't really do much about that. If you had a conflict, you were supposed to take it to the legal authorities. But that's not what's going on here. What's happening here? They don't want to go to the Roman legal system. What do they do? They bring it to the pastor or the rabbi, as it were. And they say, hey, teacher... Tell us what we're supposed to do. And here's the way this normally happens. Usually the person that brings the, person, brings the issue to the pastor is the one that already thinks they're right. Think about that for a second. That's the way it normally happens. Somebody will come to me or something like that, and they'll say, hey, listen, I, I, we've got a problem in this situation, and uh, I need you to come in and, and, and give us some direction uh, about what God's Word said. But the problem is, is that oftentimes we've already decided what God's Word says. We just need the pastor to be the one to say it, right? And so what's happening in the situation is this guy's bringing this up and he's trying to put Jesus on the spot. And he's saying, hey, my brother is not giving me what I deserve. Will you tell him to give me what's mine? So Jesus hears this in the interruption of the crowd and Jesus has to reply to him. I mean, what do you do? You can't just usher him out of the room. You, apply, you reply to him. And so Jesus asked him a question. And the question he asks is in verse 14. Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator between you? The you is plural. Then he says to them. So he's talking to both of them. So this insinuates that the brother that didn't get everything is sitting somewhat in the same room with the brother that took from him. And so there's a family issue that's going on. And he, said, he asked between the two of them, he says, hey, He's like, why are you asking me? Why don't you just go to the Roman authorities? Why don't you go to the legal system? But since you brought it up, this is a dangerous thing with Jesus. Since you brought it up, let me go ahead and teach a little bit to everybody. Because you want a ruling, and I want your heart. You want to know what's right and what's wrong, and I want to go beneath the surface. So what does he say? He says, hey, you and you. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Essentially, what does he say? He says, I'm going to give you one thing to watch, a, watch out for, to be aware of, and I'm going to give you one truth to embrace. There's one thing that is going on here that you have to be aware of that you've got to watch out for because there's something natural in all of us that's happening. But there's a new way. I want you to watch out for greed. And then the other thing I want you to understand is there's a truth you've got to embrace. Your life is so wrapped up right now in this issue because it deals with stuff and what's yours and what you need. Your life doesn't consist of the abundance of your possessions. That's not the true meaning of life. Something to watch out for and a truth to embrace now, why would he say this in a setting like this? And Jesus frequently would not allow people just to deal with surface level issues. And that's what most of us want with church. Most of us want with church and we want with spirituality. Just tell me the right and the wrong and I'll just do it. That's morality. That's, that's not spirituality. Spirituality with Jesus says there's something that's fueling your actions. The rights and the wrongs of what we do. The gospel says... The reality is that there's something driving our decisions. There's something driving our efforts. And so when Jesus says, I want you to watch out for greed, what he saw is he saw some people that didn't think they were greedy, but actually were. And that's true of all of us. I mean, probably if I ask you, do you feel like you're a greedy person? I would dare say that there would be hardly anybody in the room that feels as if they're greedy. 
I mean, if I were to ask you, do you struggle with greed? You'd say, well, no, I don't really struggle with greed, but there's another area I struggle with. Somebody might say, I struggle with lust, or I struggle with an addiction, or I struggle with anger. But very few people see greed in themselves. Greed is subversive. Greed sneaks in subtly. And in this family, it had snuck into the individual's heart. And so what Jesus does is he says, listen, you're wanting to deal on the surface, but what I'm telling you is there's something natural in you right now that I see that has to be corrected. What's greed and how do you know if you have it? Well, greed in its essence is a search for something. The first thing it's a search for is it's a search to feel significant. Everybody wants that, right? Everybody wants the notoriety, you want the accolades, you want some more possessions to validate that you have arrived. I mean, it's somewhat of the corporate ladder that you're trying to climb up in whatever field you're in. And you don't have to be a professional to do that. I mean, you can, uh, it can be in anything. I mean, we, we can all have this search for significance. We want things to mean things, right? And so this is natural in us. It's ingrained in us, and it's not wrong in essence. But what is wrong when we search for significance in the wrong ways? When we look to the wrong things to bring us significance. You see, the difference that Jesus is going to reveal to us is the gospel reveals to us that our significance is not something that we have not yet attained. Our significance has already been wrought in eternity through the power of the cross and our identity in Christ. And so if we already possess significance, then we don't have to search for significance. And so greed for us, when we deepen our understanding of our significance in Christ, it it allows us to have a warning system when our affections turn to other things to find our significance there. And oftentimes in our culture, as it was in theirs, the first place we look to is how much stuff do I have? How much money do I have? What can I have to make me feel significant? But for some of you and some of us, we would say, well, I don't really have that problem. I don't really want to drive a nicer car. I don't live in a bigger house. But what you would probably say is, I want to feel a little bit more safe. I want to feel a little bit more secure. See, there's different ways approaching greed. Sometimes greed looks like getting more, and sometimes greed looks like hoarding more, saving more. It, it, it's, it's making sure that you, you've got enough for every contingency in the future. And there's a, there's a balance, obviously, with being prudent and being frugal and being wise, but it very easily can tip over, and that's why we have to watch out, right? That's why it says be on your guard, because nobody thinks of their savings as greed. We're just being responsible. We're just taking care of business. But what Jesus would say, hey, watch out, because in the same way you will search for significance through things, you will also search for security and safety with your things. I mean, let's just be honest. I I feel a lot more comfortable when I've got some money in savings than when I don't. Every time we build up savings, I feel a little bit better. I feel a little bit more peace. And when I don't have as much savings, I don't feel that way. Why? Because oftentimes my heart gets attached to safety in things. So some of us in here, well, I would say all of us, we have to watch out for greed because it's subtle. And none of us assume that we're greedy. But the other thing he said was that. Was, that was the thing to avoid, right? Or the thing to watch out for. But he also says there's a truth to embrace. The truth to embrace is that your life does not consist of the abundance of things. It, what that means is that most of us don't necessarily assume that we have enough things. Uh, that we, if we have a little bit more things, we will be a little bit more who we're supposed to be. And we don't think of ourselves greedy and we don't think of ourselves as rich. But here's the stark reality. In America, if you live here and if you make $48,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of wage earners in the world. That means that you are in the 1% club. $48,000 a year. What that means is you don't feel rich. Uh, Matter of fact, a Gallup poll not too long ago was taken and they asked people that made $30,000 a year, they said, well, hey, uh, what does it mean to be rich? And they said, well, Probably about sixty to seventy thousand would be rich. They asked people in the same poll, sixty seventy thousand uh, dollar annual range. They said, "Well, what does it take to be rich?" They said, ah, "It's probably about one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty thousand." They asked millionaires that made an annual net worth had an annual net worth of five million dollars. They said, "Hey, 
um, what does it mean to be rich? And they said, well, probably about $10 million. You see, there's something in, none of us, in all of us. None of us necessarily think we're greedy, and none of us think we're rich. But the reality, by comparison, which is the way we love to measure ourselves in America, right? We love to compare ourselves with ourselves. If we were really going to span out and compare ourselves to the true uh, measure across the globe, then anyone that made over $48,000 would be considered rich. See, being at that point is a good thing, right? I mean, that, that, that allows you to have a car. If you had a car or you rode in a car to get here, that means 99% of the world's population would look at you and make, look at me and they would say, man, I can't imagine living like that. They, those people are rich. And then to park it in a house that's designed for your car called a garage. Like they was like, you have a house for your car? I can't imagine being rich like that. I mean, some of us have phones, and our phones are not broken, but we want to get this upgrade of a phone, so we will take our perfectly good phone and get another phone. You know, only rich people do stuff like that. The fact that after we leave today, that you're already thinking about, I know you're thinking about it, where am I going to eat? Right? And the fact that you're thinking about, and you're asking the question where, and it's not if, you're going to eat, but it's where you're going to eat. By world population standards, we're all rich. And so the question is that Jesus raises in two statements. He raises the question, listen, watch out because you may be greedy. And watch out because you may actually already be rich and not even realize it. And so what does Jesus do? to people that struggle with greed and that struggle with possessions. He tells a story. And here's the story he tells. He told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. That is a successful farmer, right? If you have a banner year and you've got so much and you're like, man, what do I do? I've got so much stuff. I mean, I've been successful. I planted, I worked the ground, I sacrificed, I slaved away, and here, what I have reaped, I, what I have sown, I have now reaped. This is a good thing. This is the American dream. This is what we all aspire and hope to in whatever profession or whatever field that we move into. But in the midst of his abundance, he has this conversation with himself. And this is what he says to himself. This is what I'll do. I'm going to tear down my barns, and I'm going to build some bigger ones. And there I'll store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, and I, the ESV says it this way, self or soul, because that's what you do when you talk to yourself apparently. You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. This guy is on the lifestyles of the rich and famous first century edition, right? This is what it's about. This is, this is what you want to see happen. Now, you get enough stuff, you have enough, so you can get some uh, freedom, and you can store enough away where you don't have to work as hard, or maybe not as all. Maybe you're, maybe you're doing that passive income thing where your money's making money for you now. I, I'm going to take life easy. I'm going to go to some good restaurants. I'm going to take some vacations. Uh, I, I'm going to drink what I want, eat what I want, go where I want. I'm going to have a good time because, after all, this is what life is all about. This is what it means to be rich. But there was a problem. Jesus wasn't finished with his story. He turns it on its head and he says, God now speaks to him. And he says, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. And then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? You see, this guy's having a conversation with himself about himself and about, him stu about his stuff, but he forgets the fact that there's another voice in the picture, and it's God's voice. And he says, you fool. The designation or the title for the man went from being a rich man to a foolish man. Now, why is that? 
was because he falsely assessed a few things. The first thing was is he had a presumption that was incorrect, and it dealt with his time. It's something Jesus' brother James actually picked up on later. This became ingrained in the understanding of what it meant to be follow Christ, a new way, not a natural way, but a new way of looking at our stuff. And this is what the brother of Jesus, James, said in chapter 4. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go and to this city and this or, this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. This seems like a good businessman, right? And it is. I mean, if you're in a business, you've got to project, you've got to think, you've got to go to new frontiers, you've got to innovate, you've got to do these things. And, and, and so what he seems like he's saying is don't plan. But that's actually, we're going to learn, that that's not actually what he's saying. The problem is not that he's planning for tomorrow, it's the way he's approaching his planning. He's presuming for with a faulty presumption about time and planning. And so he, he says, okay, yeah, look to the future, but let me ask you a question. It's the same question he heard Jesus ask. What was the question? He says, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while, and then it vanishes. Now, we all kind of, kind of see that imagery, but just in case you need a little help, this is what he essentially was saying. He was saying, this is your life. It's there, and it's gone. And I know this because uh, I just had a, a daughter graduate high school, and we put all the pictures on the board, and we had the ones when she was a baby, we had the ones when she graduated kindergarten, we had the one when she was in sixth grade, and we had all the years in between, and it led up to a graduation date. And it's easy, and I heard this comment so many times at a graduation with so many different people, and I've heard the same thing through the years, is it went by so fast. Man, the years flew by. It seemed like it was just yesterday people say that. But usually when people say that, they're looking back, not looking forward. It's easy for us to look back and to see the reality that our life is a mist and a vapor. But it's quite another thing, and it's quite unnatural to look ahead and to see the same thing. You see, with Jesus, what James tells us is the same thing Jesus was trying to tell us in the story. He was like, listen, you're presuming upon tomorrow. If you would look back and see how fast it went, and if you would take that same mentality and look forward, then it would change your vantage point about the way you saw your future and the way you saw your stuff. So what should you do if you want to watch out for greed? And if you don't want your life to be about your stuff, he says instead, you, what you ought to say, it doesn't mean don't plan, but it, what it does say is when you plan, you ask a different question. If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. I mean, I thought evil was killing somebody. I thought evil was committing adultery. I thought evil was taking the Lord's name in vain. You know what James says? That the heart of the gospel says is that not to, to look to your future and not consider what the Lord's will is for your life is evil. Why? Because your life belongs to your God. That means that not only your life belongs with Him, is your tomorrow belongs to Him. And your next year belongs to him. Seniors, your college years. You don't get a pass for the next four years. And then you get to jump back in. People have tried that. What God tells us is that tomorrow, the next year, next week, the next relationship, that those belong to God. And so, yes, plan. Yes, look ahead, but don't presume about time because you're not promised tomorrow. And so what is the best way to approach tomorrow is to live for Jesus today, right now. Do the next right thing in front of you. That means you look at your considerations in the future and say, what would God have me do? What does God's word tell me to do? And I just try to live underneath that. And in God's grace, through my successes and my failures, God will direct my paths. But it's when we look to our future and we ask a different question that it alerts us to the greed that's in our heart. Because left to our natural way, all of us are greedy. 
All of us need significance that we haven't found in the gospel, and we all want safety and security that we haven't found in Christ. What is your life? It's a mist. It's a vapor. It appears for a second, and it's gone. And if you would look back and say that, look forward and say the same thing. That was the problem with the character, the rich man, the fool, in Jesus' story. But that wasn't the only problem. The other problem was he didn't just make a presumption. He also had an assumption. It rhymed, right? See how I did that? And his assumption wasn't about time. His assumption was about his things. Remember what he said? God says to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for who? Yourself. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Did you know you can be earthly rich and heavenly poor? You can have a lot of earthly possessions and you can be rich by objective standards, uh, with, by measurements of our culture and our day. Like what's rich today? How much money do you need to make to be considered rich? You can be rich today with possessions. You can have a nice car, a nice house, nice stuff. And you can be not rich toward God. You can be God poor, if you would say it that way. How do you make the difference? I mean, how do you change from being just earthly rich, which we've already established everybody in here is. Everybody in here is. To some level, we're rich. How then do we become rich toward God? Well, there's the two things that were illuminated in Jesus' story. One was the simple fact that this guy stored up things for himself. Yourself, storing up things for yourself. The object of your things is you. The other thing is, is that you don't take account of a bigger story of what it could mean in God's story. To, to answer that question of what it means to be rich, fortunately, we get, uh, Scripture talks about this a lot. It talks about how to actually have a life that's rich toward God. And one of the clearest places you can see it is in a conversation that uh, Paul has with his young protege, Timothy. And 1 Timothy chapter 6 records it in verse 17. And this is what he says. He says, command those who are rich in this present world, that's you and me, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. How do you first become rich toward God? Well, the first thing is you don't put your hope in your riches. You put your hope in your God who richly provides it's really easy for us to, to look to things and to fall in love with things and to find significance and safety in things. I mean, it's natural after all. But when we come into a relationship with God, we, we change our position fundamentally to where we don't have to ask those questions anymore, but the world around us is screaming at us to find significance and safety in everything else. Well, you don't have enough, or you need this, or you need that. God's Word, God's Spirit, God's favor, God's faithfulness brings us back and we remind ourselves of the fact, listen, like, it's not the stuff that I need, it's the God who could provide all things. It's a good thing to frequently ask a question in your Christian walk, if you want to call it that, do I, lie, do I love God or do I love the stuff that He'll provide? It's real easy to see where you are on that on the scale is oftentimes is like, how grateful are you for what you already have? If most of your concern is about what you don't have, rather than being grateful for what you do have, it's a good indicator that your focus and my focus has moved toward greed and detached itself from the significance and the safety I have in God toward things. It doesn't mean you don't ask God for things. I have financial needs. I got a kid going to college. Hello, you know. Like, I've got that. I've got, three, I've got three other kids. I've got a house payment. I've got all those things. And I totally understand. And the battle for me is the same as it is for you. Is how much am I going to focus on what I don't have and how much am I going to thank God for what I do have? Because when I begin to thank God for what I do have, when I see Him as the one who richly provides, it changes my affection and my perspective and my assumptions about my stuff. It actually allows me to see what I have and then begin to leverage it for God's story and not my own. Verse 18 tells us what to do with the stuff. It's the second step. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous 
and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of what? Life that is truly life. You see, what Paul told Timothy is the same thing he had heard passed down to him. It's the same thing the gospel always says. Is this like we talked about last week, uh, that feeling emotional or feeling guilty is not spirituality. Spirituality can begin at conviction, but it resp- its response is changed behavior. God begins to change us. We can't do that. Like, no, love is not natural for somebody that doesn't love me back. That's not natural, but there's a new way. For me not to hold on to my stuff, but to give it away, that's not natural, but it's a new way. And the only way for that to happen is when I focus on the goodness of God and He becomes my provider, I can look at my stuff and I can say, you know, how can I put my stuff to good use? How can I take this stuff that I don't have to have for significance and meaning and safety, but I can begin to tell it, I can change its power. I can take the power it has because it's powerful and I can put it to work and I can lay up treasures for myself For what age? For the coming age. So many of us are concerned with the the, the mist and the vapor of life that's here today and gone tomorrow that we forget that on the other side of the mist, on the other side of the vapor, is eternity. And what God is concerned about is not temporal life alone, but attaching your moments of your life, these routine, sometimes mundane things of your life, attaching to eternal significance and eternal assurance. That's life that's truly life. Jesus, he actually finished his talk that way. There's a lot of things he said in Luke 12. I'd encourage you to go read it. We don't have time for all of it. But if you drop down to verse 32, he actually says the same thing you heard Paul say. He says, don't be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. He says, when he's the one you see that richly provides, you understand that he wants to give you everything he has, that he holds nothing back. Sell your possessions and give them to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. What does he say? He says, do something radical. Throughout the centuries, the thing that has made the church, uh, has given the longest and loudest testimony of the church, is their, the freedom that they have with their possessions. Through history, if you lead, read early church fathers and early church history, the thing that set the church apart was they did not hold on to their possessions, but they gave them fr- freely. If you read Acts chapter 2, it says that they had all things in common. They shared with one another as anyone would have need. They would give it to the apostles, and the apostles would look for places to have need. You see, this is not the natural way of doing business in life. This is a new way. And this way actually comes with benefits. The benefits it has is it actually provides for you purses that will not wear out. And you know what purses are? They're places to store things. Right, ladies? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I've seen your purses. Y'all got some stuff in there, right? Uh, you can put some stuff in there. What he's saying is simply this, is into eternity, you have a place to store plenty of things. And so my question is, if it's not about possessions now, what in the world is Jesus talking about storing? If possessions truly don't matter, and if money doesn't truly matter as far as your meaning in life goes, then what's heaven going to be like? I mean, is it going to be us all like getting in the nice subdivision in heaven on the gold, you know, on Golden Street, and you're on the Crystal Sea, and you've got, you know, you got frontage on the Crystal Sea, you can see everything? Is that is that what this is about? Is that what's going to get stored up in those purses that won't ever fade and fail? No, I don't think so. I think what God is talking about here is something that will not ever fade. And what is something that will not fade? Because I've bought a lot of stuff, and it's all faded. Most of it's in my garage in cardboard boxes and got brown recluses crawling in it, right? To be perfectly honest. And I need to clean that thing out. So what is it that gets stored? I'll tell you what gets stored. Stories. Stories get stored in heaven. 
And the solution for our greed and our affection is to turn our stuff into stories because stuff will fade and stories will not. You know, whenever I, we've, we've baptized a lot of people through the last several years we've been here. I, I haven't added it all up, but over the course of the years, there's been tons of people that have come through here and been baptized. And a lot of times I'm sitting over here, I'm over there, or I'm sitting up here and I'm watching. And never once have I heard a story where I go like, man, I wish I could have my money back. Never. Never have I met with a couple whose marriage has been restored and said, man, I wish I had my money back. Never have I been at a funeral service and stood over a casket and anyone's asked me, man, tell me more about their stuff. That's never happened to me. I've heard people stand up and share stories of how their life was changed by someone. And those are the things that will last into eternity. And so what would happen in our life if we would do something radical enough to say, I don't even have to have my possessions. There's something right now I'm finding my significance in and my safety in, and I will sell it, and I will give it away, and I will give it into the kingdom of God. I will begin maybe to tithe, or maybe I'll see this single mom over here that needs a car, or maybe there's a neighborhood that needs ministering to, or maybe there's a whole city block, or maybe there's a trailer park, or maybe there's a school. Maybe there's something that God has burdened your heart for, a people group on the other side of the planet, and you would say, it's going to mean that I'm going to have to give up my job and my livelihood, and everybody's going to say, that makes no sense. Why would you do that? It's because I'm about stories, not stuff. What would happen in our church if we became a people that were concerned about stories and not stuff? I mean, we could build a building over here, and it can either be the best thing or the worst thing for us. It could be stuff, or it could be a place, a house for stories. We could go into these neighborhoods around here, and we could plant churches locally. We could go into college campuses and plant churches. And we could do that, and it could be stuff for us, or our motivation could be, let's create some stories. Let's create some environments where some stories can happen, where people's lives can be changed. What would happen over the next nine months in our church if we became a people that didn't do what was natural, but we did what was new? And we tra- transferred our trust from stuff to stories. Because Jesus ended his passage with a provocative statement that's hung around for about 2,000 years. And he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. The heart of the Father is about the stories, not the stuff. What has your heart? And what has my heart? Where's your treasure? And where's mine? I want to end today with giving you the opportunity to do something radical, to bow your head and close your eyes. And you say, that's not radical. We do it every week. But what you do after that could be, when you could say to God, you could look at your stuff, you could look at where you're finding your significance and your safety, and you'd be willing to say to God, God, here it is. You have my life. You have my stuff. You have my tomorrow. Would you go write some stories with it? And then what if you went out of here and you did good with it? What if you said, that's my priority, and you started to live, and you started to transfer your treasure into the future, into eternity, into someone else's story? That's where life is really life is. And so would you bow your head and do that? Would you close your eyes? And I'm not going to ask you to come. Uh, We're not passing buckets or doing anything like that. I'm not asking you to give today here. I'm asking you to give to God right now what is rightfully His. And it's not just a percentage, it's all of yourself. It's all of your life. Would you give that to Him right now? Some of you know exactly what that means. Some of you right now, you need to begin by giving Him your life truly. You've never done that before. You've never given Him your true self. Sure, you, you've tried to do some good things. You've tried to do the good stuff, but you've missed the relationship with Jesus. And so this is not an effort to get you to do more. This is an, a, an effort right now to relinquish your control to the one who richly provides. So would you confess your sin before Him today? Would you accept Him 
as your Savior and your Lord? Would you repent of your sin? Would you turn away from it and to turn your trust toward Jesus Christ, placing your faith in Him as your Lord and your Savior? If you would confess that to Him today, He will accept you right now and He will receive you and He will make you new. He is a God who richly provides. In just a few minutes, we're going to sing a song. It's a simple song. It's a way to kind of give testimony to what we're saying, saying right now. And I'm going to be right up here at the front on the corner. I'm not staying up front where everybody can see, but I kind of find myself over in the front row on, uh, on my right, your left. I'd love it if you come talk to me after service ends. Uh, everyone leaves. There's always some deacons and some ministers, some of our men and women that hang out at the front with love to talk to you and to pray with you. Every one of us right now, we want to give God all of ourselves. Father, we thank you. Thank you that you held nothing back from us. You are a God who richly provides. Help us to watch out for what's natural for us. It's our greed and it's our possessions and it's our affections, our faulty assumptions, our presumption about tomorrow. Lord, we want to live for you today and we want to give you all of ourselves. And you're the only one that can enable that in us. And so we ask you to give us the boldness, the confidence to trust you today. For the person that's in here today that's struggling and they're saying, yeah, but I've got all these problems, financial problems. I don't know how I'm going to make it tomorrow. I don't feel rich. I pray, God, you give them the courage right now to come and talk to one of us or we can get them connected to somebody that wants to help them or we want to help one another so that we can live in the freedom of life. For the person that's struggling alone today, God, I pray that you would encourage them and give them the peace, but help them to also know they have a church that cares and can help. We'll get them connected to people you've gifted to help them climb out of the pit that they're in. And so, Lord, wherever we find ourselves, we give ourselves to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.